In 1381, the peasants were revolting. Truly disgusting. On an unrelated topic, there was actually a peasants' revolt in 1381. It began in Essex as a response to the harsh economic demands of Parliament, and was one of the most significant uprisings in Europe during the medieval period. A national movement of people that spread as far as York and Scarborough in the northeast and over to Somerset in the southwest of England. Previous uprisings had always been led by noblemen, ambitious to overthrow the out of touch government and seize power for themselves. This time it was different. The so called Peasants' Revolt was led by a group of commoners, men like Watt Tyler, John Ball, and Jack Straw. A group of men and women from all walks of life who wanted to radically change English society rather than seek out personal advancement. Let's travel back in time and try and understand why the peasants revolted in 1381. Welcome to Medieval Madness. The Instability of a Boy King King Edward III had died four years earlier. His eldest son and heir, the popular Black Prince, died before his father, and so his grandson Richard II had succeeded to the throne instead. But Richard was only ten years old, just a boy king, leaving him dependent on his uncle John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster. The Hundred Years' War, which actually went on for 116 years, had been raging since 1337. Tensions between the crowns of England and France over territory went back centuries, with English kings rightly or wrongly making claim to the French throne. This made it a major source of ongoing conflict between the two monarchies, often punctuated by a series of brief periods of peace. Henry V famously won the Battle of Agincourt in 1415 and actually became King of France. By 1381, King Richard was still only 14 years old. Having no official role didn't matter to his uncle John of Gaunt. The authoritarian was unpopular and feared, but now being the eldest surviving son of the late King Edward, he was the most dominant noble in England and the real power behind the throne. Royal authority was dependent on the backing of the English nobility. The House of Lancaster had over 30 castles, and a private army of 4,000 men. With Gaunt at its head, it therefore had great sway over the governance of the kingdom. The Church The influence of the church was everywhere, dominating daily life. Their magnificent buildings overshadowed both town and country. All citizens were legally obligated to give a tenth of their wealth to the church, either in cash from their wages or by rent in kind from grain, wool or other goods. The church also demanded extra payments too, such as on feast days or for mortuary fines when a parishioner died. All of this money had made the church very wealthy, with some abbots and bishops living extravagant and immoral lifestyles. In the late 14th century, this caused all parts of English society to question the church's position and whether it should relinquish its wealth. But the courtiers around young King Richard, including his mother and John of Gaunt, protected the church. Whether this was because they genuinely believed in its sanctity, or because they wanted a contribution towards the war effort, is debatable. Taxes and Wars The Black Death had arrived in England in 1348, wiping out up to half of the population, leaving death, devastation, and a time of real social upheaval in its wake. Many of those who survived found that their financial circumstances much improved. A shortage of manpower created greater opportunities for those at the bottom of the social ladder, who were able to demand higher wages, negotiate better terms of employment, and even purchase more land. But the government brought in sumptuary laws to not only bar labourers from getting higher wages, but also to stop them wearing high quality clothing and restrict their diet. Despite these restrictions, a new middle class of merchants, artisans, and even farmers were created. An ambitious class that had become numerate and literate, and were enjoying both physical and social mobility. The government, employers, and private landowners all sought to exploit this newfound wealth that had been created by what they believed were their inferiors. The people of England were heavily taxed, and the money collected had been spent on what was now seen as pointless military assaults, which did nothing to improve the lives of the people at home. 
In the 1370s, a new community tax was brought in that saw a levy on every parish in England and Wales. Areas with the densest population were most severely hit, such as East Anglia. Suffolk saw its contribution increase by a shocking 103%. And then in January of 1377, the government ushered in the first poll tax. Everyone had to pay, the only exceptions being children under 14 and beggars. Now, the people were already becoming restless, but things only got worse. Between the years of 1377 and 1381, three poll taxes were brought in that had to be paid regardless of status or wealth. The commissioners that were sent out to enforce these payments were ruthless in taking the money being told to collect it by all manner ways and means. For the nobleman, the extra levy was relatively painless, but for the ordinary working man, the farmers and tradesmen, it was financially crippling. And as if that wasn't enough, the French were also launching raids on the south coast of England, and the people were becoming increasingly afraid of an invasion. Instability, taxes, church corruption, a failing war, and measures aimed at suppression of the people, it was a perfect storm and a revolt was inevitable. In London, in the April of 1381, the commissioners were unable to collect the taxes without it causing dangerous agitation amongst the population. Then, a collector was attacked in Oxfordshire by a group of assailants. The aptly named William Payable was tortured and beaten. And he wasn't the last. Random outbreaks of resistance began, especially in Kent and the other counties surrounding London, before spreading to East Anglia and beyond. By the beginning of June, the rebels were organising their uprising and preparing to move on London. Flying the banner of St George and led by their captain, a man named Watt Tyler, the target of the Kentish rebels was not young King Richard, but rather the faction of noble families around him. On the 2nd of June, the renegades swore allegiance to their king, wanting to save him from the harmful influence of John of Gaunt. The rebellion was quite well organised, and all over the country men travelled on horseback to different settlements spreading news of the rebellion. Groups began to destroy manorial records, which chronicled the unfree station of many of the peasants. The Leaders not much is known about two of the revolt's leaders, neither Walter Tyler, although his name is synonymous with the uprising, or his comrade Jack Straw. Both men seem to emerge from complete obscurity, and there is little known about their background or motives. Some historians even argue that the two men are the same person, as many of the organisers used pseudonyms. Tyler led the rebels to Canterbury on the 10th of June, there they sacked the Archbishop's palace. Simon Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury and Lord Chancellor, was one of King Richard's closest advisers, and responsible for suggesting a new poll tax just the year before a tax which ensured that the poor paid more than the rich. After destroying documents and freeing prisoners from the jail, the rebels moved on to London and camped on Blackheath on the 12th of June. It was there that John Ball gave one of his most famous sermons on freedom and equality. It's thought that around 30,000 rebels marched onto London. The Lollard priest John Ball had a central role as the spiritual voice of the people. Already imprisoned for his belief in equality, Ball preached his criticism of the lords with their extravagant clothing, fine houses and overindulgence, in contrast to the commoners who were working for the lords' benefit and receiving little in return. Ball whipped up public opinion against those in power, and helped to motivate an already agitated populace. After being arrested and imprisoned for sedition, he was released by the rebels as they made their way towards London. On entering the city on the 13th, the rebels caused panic amongst the nobility. King Richard, his mother, his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, the son of John of Gaunt, and other councillors retreated to the Tower of London for safety. The Savoy, John of Gaunt's luxury palace, unrivalled in splendour and nobility, was razed to the ground. But the Duke of Lancaster was lucky to be in Scotland negotiating a truce, and escaped with his life. At only 14 years old, and against the advice of his council, Richard met with Tyler and the rebels. At the first meeting outside the city walls at Mile End, he promised them a charter of liberties including the abolition of forced labour, cheap land, and free trade. Taking advantage of the king's absence, other rebels broke into the tower. It's a mystery how they got into the heavily fortified castle, but they were probably let in by sympathisers. 
After capturing Chancellor Sudbury and the Lord High Treasurer Robert Hales, they were taken to Tower Hill and beheaded. Gaunt's son, Henry Bolingbroke, was lucky. He managed to escape capture and later went on to seize the throne for himself, becoming King Henry IV. With his uncle bargaining with the Scots and his army spread out across Wales, France and Scotland, King Richard II, fearing for his life, spent the night in hiding. Despite his fear, Richard rode out to meet Tyler and his rebels again the next day, at Smithfield, a large open area outside of the city walls. Tyler was brought before the king. When asked why they would not go home, Tyler replied that they had further concessions and would not leave until they were met. There is confusion as to what happened next, but there was an altercation between Tyler and the Lord Mayor of London, and Tyler was attacked and killed. Many of the rebels began to ready their weapons, but the young king galloped towards the protesters shouting, I am your leader, and demanded that they left the field immediately. Unbelievably, Richard was able to talk the crowd down, the mob dispersed, and the uprising was crushed. The Legacy as we all know, the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 has created a world without such barbaric laws where the rich get richer and the poor stay poor. <laughs> Just kidding. Richard was unable to keep his promises due to his limited power in Parliament. He claimed he had made them under duress, and they were therefore not valid anyway. Those named as ringleaders were executed. Although the poll tax was revoked, the peasants were forced to return to their earlier lives controlled by either lord or church. Not for the first time did the ordinary people of England learn how foolish it was to trust their rulers. John Ball fled to Coventry, but was arrested. At trial, he was found guilty, and unwilling to repent of his treason, he was hanged, drawn and quartered on the 15th of July in St Albans, whilst Richard watched. Nicknamed the Mad Priest of Kent, his head was displayed on London Bridge, along with that of Watt Tyler, whose body was publicly decapitated and his head was carried on top of a pole through the city first. Although the rebels' demands were not met, some historians believe that the Peasants' Revolt is a defining moment in our history. Over 60,000 people are thought to have been involved in the rebellion. By November of that year, over 1,500 rebels were killed, including its leaders. But in just over one month, this resolute band of people had fought for the rights of the working man, for freedom and equality. Fundamental principles that are at the heart of every democracy. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please do subscribe if you enjoy the content as we do release a new video every Friday. Cheers!